Uh, let's go for this session about building advanced bots. Uh, it will be the two of us will try to give you as much as our experience. Uh, DG and I spend a lot of time. Uh, yeah, we're being paid to create bots and fun things. That's what I like. Um, I'm part of DevNet. DevNet is Cisco developer program. Uh, we help developer communities get used to Cisco APIs. You've got, we've got about 80 APIs. Some need Cisco hardware. Then we provide uh, back-end data centers. You can connect to those hardware, IP phones, cameras, everything. Hubs, data centers, servers. Or we have cloud technologies, and you can just get an ID, and you can do your stuff and do the create your own bot like we'll show today. And I do a lot of development, and I live in France. You could, I think you recognize it from my accent. Some people are French. There are Français dans la salle. Woo! Yes, I like that. Ah, OK. Let's have a party tonight. And all of you are invited. You know, you'd all speak French by the end of night. Um, I'm part of Paris Innovation Center. Uh, we do crazy thing with new IPv6, upcoming technologies, video, and all that. And you can find me on Twitter. And oh, I have prepared a slide for you later, DG. This is DG. A short word <laughs> now, or do you want to talk yeah. later? Yeah, so first of all, I would really like to know uh, where you got your happy pills. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, Dirk Jan Uitenboogaard. And um, if you, you may guess that I'm actually Dutch, and if you're not Dutch, feel free to call me DJ, which is a lot easier. And uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, oh, no, you can do it now. Oh, wow, you're fast. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm in the Cisco Digital Transformation Team, so that's all not interesting. I'm a consulting systems engineer. I'm not a real programmer, yet I'm so surprised by what, what I'm able to build as, as not being a real programmer. Um, I love home automation, and I have some examples on that uh, integrated with, uh, with Cisco Spark later. So please stick around to, uh, to see uh, what I did. And uh, I'm very good at pretending to know stuff about JavaScript, Node.js, uh, Python, Django. Um, and in a very, very, very previous life, I've done a lot with assembly and Pascal and Visual Basic. Yeah. Um, so let's let's look at what uh, what, what we Steve has to say, what okay. he has uh, for you, and uh, I'll jump in uh, later in the session. Okay, then what's on the menu today? And we'll try to take you from zero to understanding what a bot is, and then when you have understood what a bot is, how you can build them, then we'll go to the next stage. What's missing in the bot industry today? Okay. Who among you has already built a bot? That's cool. Then for the first part, it should be pretty easy because bot principles always apply. For the second part, I'd be interested to have your views about what, you, what we think is missing there. Um, then, yeah, about, about myself, uh, I, joined this, I joined Cisco a year and a half ago. Uh, I was kind of an open source guy doing REST APIs, and I discovered those messaging tools we have. And then I started with my kids. Uh, I, Olivia is my kid, and is, I created this Daisy bot. She was six at that time, five, five, five and a half. And she wasn't writing a lot. She was just learning writing. And this was a great tool, because it was no more about going to an iPad. It was typing stuff and asking the bot, could you give me a dog, please? Could you give me a dog and a cat together? And, and that was impressive. And now she's so brilliant. She can, she can write. And the words, they come in the right spelling. And I didn't did, did that with the other one, the older one. And she has more difficulties with writing the words. The first spelling is not the right one. That she needs to learn. Then I think it's the time she spent playing with the bots I made at that time. I'm happy to imagine that. <laughs> um, then that was that, that was the fun part. And then I said, okay, uh, it can be professional too. Uh, my job is not really professional. I do conferences. Um, but then, as I do conferences, I created this DevNet bot. 
Oh, is, it's as easy as you want to contact your bot. Then a bot is nothing that an email address generally. Then if I want to contact Cisco DevNet bot, I just plug his name. And then I will say, OK, hey, bot, what's going on now? And the bot should answer that it's got motion at the moment. Mm, I hope it will answer it's got motion. Yeah, here it is. Touch, code motion. It's us, guys. Congrats. We are live on the internet, and the bot knows about us. And then I created some more sophisticated bot, still for fun. Um, it's a bot that, um, when you're in a space, a collaboration space, uh, code motion Amsterdam, um, I want to add in there. Um, my, another me, I will add DG, and I will add the room ID bot. Mm. Then here, say hi, guys. Then yeah, OK, I'm not a good writer. And can you see it there? The room ID bot, he left the space. He's not there anymore. It's, it's, it's written there. He left the place. Then. It's about that when, we, when, when you invite him, he just leaves the room without noticing anybody. He's left the room. Then you don't know when he jumps in. You don't know when he jumps out. But look at here. here. He created another space. In fact, what he did, he sneaked into the room. And I said, he said, hey, I retrieved some technical information from you from this room. <laughs> this is the identifier of the room. Then it's really a developer thing. Because I really need these IDs to plug the rooms and to do my demos. But I don't want to annoy people by having someone say, hey, I'm a bot, I can help you. Uh, and you should show me the idea of the bot. Then this is a very handy tool. It's really used a lot at Cisco. And, and then, where uh, I was there. OK, then, once we see that, you, we know what a bot is. Then what does it take to code a bot? Then the basic thing for a bot is, oh, you need to choose a platform oh, to interact with your bot. Okay? Generally, we, you will want to use several platforms because you want your bot to be famous. And you'll see what are the stakes with several platforms. Oh, here, I will pick Spark, but the principles here will apply to any bot's platforms. And then your platform. Your chatting platform needs to have some API so that you can interact with it. Okay? And the best uh, API you can get is, will be a REST API, which get to get your list of rooms, post to create a message, and webhooks is where you will be sent events when something happens in your rooms. Then you have, we have picked a platform, it has an API, we have read the documentation. What do we need to do? We need to uh, expose this platform to the cloud or bot. We need to run it and to expose it to a platform. Okay, then this is where things happen. And you will register webhooks. And we will tell the platform, hey, when something happens, send it to this address because there's my bot behind. And let's see what's going on in real time when you do that with Cisco Spark. Then the tool here I will use is first, I will create a bot account. Then I will go to developer.ciscospark.com. Here is the address. Oh, I have to press enter. And I just need network connectivity. That is doable. OK. Then I say, OK, my apps. I have a lot of apps. I want to create a new type of thing. I want to create a bot. What will be the name of the bot? OK, Code Motion Amsterdam. I'm not very inventive. OK, 2017. And the bot name? Code Motion? Is it taken? Ah, oh, Amsterdam. Taken? No, good. An icon? Oh. I need an icon for my, oh, I like kittens. You could guess that. I like this place. It's called Place Kitten. You just say, OK, I want something like 1,100. 
and it gives you a picture of something that looks like it. Oh, yeah, this is a 512 by 250, okay, then. Oh, someone in France gave me that, that tip. Then now I've got a bot, it has a name, it has an address, it will be caught motion at Cisco Spark. .io, and I create the bot. What the, it creates a virtual identity in the cloud, and it will give me a token to access the API and to start receiving notifications. Then, now that the bot exists, I can go back to my messaging tool, Cisco Spark, and I can create a space when I will talk to my bot. Conmotion Amsterdam 2017, I say hi. Okay, there's no code behind, there's nothing, it's just a virtual identity, I have to branch something, okay? And then, what do you do? Uh, what you do is you want to take this token that has been created, and you will want to create a webhook to register it so that your platform will start sending notifications to you. Then you create in REST is post when you want to create thing. Then here you want to create a webhook. And you replace your, this is me. I replace this token by the bot token. It's its identity. And I say conmotion. And I want to post message somewhere. Oh, I don't know where yet. And I want all message to be posted. But I don't know where to post it. How can I do that? I need to build an API now to receive the messages. Uh, I've got a tool I like very much, uh, an open source, a free tool built by Runscope. It's called Request Bin. Okay, I advise you to remember this address. It's very handy. Uh, what Request Bin does is just you go there, you say I want to create a bin. It's a place where anything that gets posted, it will show it to you. Okay, then I pick this address here. Shoot, and I say, okay, just post information there, okay? And the good part is that it can also be HTTPS, I think. Yeah, I think request bin supports HTTPS. Let's try it, HTTPS, because generally when you send information out of your platform, yeah, I got an okay here, okay? then. I'm good, I said I want this stuff to be created, I say run, and now I'm creating a post request, and I want to create a webhook, I get a webhook ID, and now my endpoint is receiving events from Cisco Spark when anything happens to my bot, and I'm going to say, hello, dear bot. Okay, I just posted a message here. Then let's go back to request bin, and see if it noticed anything. Then here, we had that eight seconds ago. Yeah, real time. You will have a payload coming. Okay, it's JSON in there. And what does it say? Yeah, I have a piece of JSON. Ah, oh, it's not easy to read. I will need a JSON viewer, editor online, something like that. Uh, we paste it there. Shh, crack, crack. Yeah, show me that. Okay, then this is what I just created. Got it, my cookies, got it, my cookies. Okay. And then here, yeah, then this is information you receive. You have created a bot, is that an identity? You have registered it and you start receiving on an endpoint on the internet. You got to receive at this URL the message has been created. And this is uh, who created it. It's an identity, it's an ID. And yeah, you've got your information to start building your bot. You've been notified in real time. Okay. Then next step, you, add, you need to add some code behind it and to expose it in the enterprise. Uh, one thing in the enterprise, the bot will be like your website. You want to put your address behind a reverse proxy in your DMZ so that you will get to that endpoint and you will go to your, to your bot that is protected, secured, and can access your enterprise data. 
Okay, then the same principles that, that you have, your web development principles and deployment uh, security guidelines, you just follow the same ones. Um, one thing is when you code on your local machine, uh, you've got a problem because your local machine is not exposed on the internet. Then you need some kind of tool to, do, to create a tunnel between yourself and the internet with a stable address that the, you will register that address, and when anything arrives on that dead point, it gets forwarded to your local machine. Uh, I know two tools to do that. You can create your own. It's just created a reverse, we're creating a reverse proxy on the internet and forwarding with a TCP connection you keep open. But if you don't want to code that, I suggest you go and look at NGWOK. There's a free version, and this is the one I'm using today for these demos. Okay. Then this is the next part, and now you're ready to have your bot exposed on the internet and being ready to go on your local machine, and then your code needs to execute. How many lines you receive? How do you do in Node.js or any technology? You create an API with an endpoint, and when JSON arrives, you just have to interpret that JSON flow, exactly the, the JSON flow I showed here. Then we have those properties. It says, oh, there's a message created by who I will answer him. And I will, I will look at what's inside that message. Okay. What a lot of people did is they created bot libraries. I built mine. Uh, you find a lot on the internet. Uh, the one I'm, I'm using in that example was the Room ID bot and Daisy and others, Cisco DevNet. Uh, I created it at a very uh, educational purpose. You will see all the steps. The code is very easy to, to read. And uh, at the end of the day, when someone says hello here, I say bot on command hello. I create a function, and then I respond spark create message. And I say hello back to the person. Okay. It's as easy as that. Um, I'm not sure I want to run it right now. I don't have enough time. Um, whatever your messaging platform is, someone has built a bot framework. OK, then no worries. You won't have to code all that stuff and all that path. You will have to create a bot account, register it for your platform, and then you just pick a framework that goes with your platform or your, the platforms you want your bot to interact with. Uh, in the Cisco Spark community, it's Flint and BotKit are the two frameworks. And then you pick those frameworks. It's, yeah, just I'm missing one slide here. Yeah, you, you want to see this slide. Then this is the type of code you would get with Flint and BotKit. Then it's very similar to what I showed earlier. It's Flint.ears, bot.say, and BotKit does it this way. Okay, then. Very easy code to write in all languages. Then, now you've got your code, and we have to think about user experience. You want your bot to behave nicely. You want to, your bot to be engaging. Then what do you need to do? In Commotion Rome, we created a bot contest. Uh, you, could, you could meet, if you register on Cisco Spark, you can go to the quiz bot. It will give you. 10 questions, and if you answer right with a minimum of time, you would get a prize. And today we have prizes. If you do labs in where we are, you get out with a, with a prize too, uh, because we value your time. Then, what do you want to do? First, when your bot enters the room, you want him to say hello. Okay? There's no worse experience than the one I had earlier here. See, Conmotion Amsterdam, when I created my bot, I'm talking to him. I don't know what he can do. Okay, then first thing, you want to add a welcome message to your bot. Welcome to the gig contest. Just type play. You explain people what your bot can do. Okay. First thing, mandatory. I am reviewer for Cisco Spark bots. Okay. We've got a marketplace. We've got bots there. Everybody's submitting. I spend a lot of time rejecting bots just because they don't have a welcome message and just want to know what that bot is going to do. Basic things. Next thing is provide an help command so that the person doesn't need to scroll back. I understand what the bot is about. It just types help or help me or something else, and you just have to give him the information. Next is a fallback command. I see very few bots having a fallback command. Fallback is the user types something that did not exist. 
It's so simple. You just don't understand. You just send back the help command. OK? I don't understand. Send me something else. I don't want my bot not to respond. OK? I'm talking to someone that says nothing. What's going on there? OK? Then it's easy. Add a fallback command to your bot, meaning you add all your treatments, all your functions for your commands. And at the end, the last one is just a fallback command. If you, under, if you didn't get any of the others, you just pick that one. OK? Can you make it? Yeah, it's easy. And now we've got a great experience. Then here, the quiz bot, if you tell him bonjour, <laughs> en français, sorry, I don't understand. He doesn't speak French. Here's what I can do. OK, your bot is not that smart. Then, another thing. I like Easter eggs. In the session before, you could, we were playing with voice messaging. If you would press number four, the voice would change from male to female, and it was a lady talking to you. Then it's, it's always important to add some Easter eggs. At ConMotion, the extra uh, ConMotion ROM, the, uh, the Easter egg was, it would give you information about the conference. What's going on next? Okay. It's not part of the context, context but people are here. So interacting with your bot, give them some valuable information. Okay, help them find their navigation to the conference. Then always think, okay, the marketing team they ask me for that bot, but can I add something more, something more fun, something more engaging, something useful? Then you've done your bot, he's got, got a good experience. What are the next stakes? Oh, in my opinion, there's two. Look at the first version of the Cisco DevNet bot I built. And uh, there, this one, here. This bot here, three events are running now. And it gives me the three. What if I want more information about those events? Shoot, I'm dead, guys. Then, what about this experience now? Slash now. This is another bot I created with BotKit. Uh, is it running? Yes. OK. Three events, look at that now. I've got a one, I've got a two, I've got a three. What if now I type about one? Okay. Then yeah, I have the information about this session. I was, oh, I, would, I should have said about three. We are at code motion. Sorry, guys. Let's delete that message. Okay, yep, I'm good. Okay, conference. Then I've got links. What's going on there? It's us. What does it take to build that experience? Now we transition from something that was just bullet points to storing context, storing data. That are user specifics. If all of us are interacting, we have to memorize the data in real time about those four events for that user, because it is his questions. And the next part is, what if someone types about, and then you want him to say about, then about, and then he says, hey, which event are you interesting about? And then now you start a branch having a sub-conversation. And then you said, about two. And when you do that, you, can, you come back to the main flow. That is where I got stuck, because that was more than my programming skills. <laughs> I had to create all those storage spaces, nested conversations. That was, I did not have the time to build that. Then this is what you will want, definitely. If you're building a bot, you will have basic steps, and then you will need to add conversations to the game. Um, how can you do that? The good thing, again, is that there's the bot you can build yourself, but there's also some community bots. This is a study that has now more than nine months. That shows that a lot of people build their own frameworks to start with. But soon, they turn to more advanced frameworks that provide those capacity to store context and to create conversations. And the one that has a lot of traction in the open source community is called BotKit. And it has a Cisco Spark interface. And then I took BotKit, the Cisco Spark connector, the conversations, and the code is live on my GitHub. You'll just type BotKit Cisco Spark examples, and you'll see them. Yeah, then we did the first part. OK, that was the easy part. Now we'll take our bots to the next stage for the next 20 minutes. And we'll drive an awesome experience with them. Can you tell us, DG, about what we can build with those technologies? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I guess 
you can hear me. Oh, great. So I can't hear myself, but uh, if you can hear me, that's good enough. So um, one of the bots that I created uh, is running on the Cisco Spark platform. So Spark is a, uh, an enterprise messaging platform. Uh, and I, I sometimes call it WhatsApp on steroids, but uh, marketing police uh, shoots me. If I, but it's a messaging platform. I can send one-on-one -on -one messages, group messages. I can do one-on-one -on -one video calls, group co video calls. I can share files. I can view files. Uh, I can search files. And everything is encrypted at that every step of the way. So that's, that's quite cool. Um, hey, hello. Calling the bot. Oh. Uh, nobody's going to answer it. It's a bot at the end of it. <laughs> Just <laughs> showing that it's one click away when you're on Cisco Spark. So... Um, but as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, big, the big difference with what Cisco has done before is after a product was built, a nice shiny product, they bolted on some APIs. And now APIs are like the core of the product. The client, the mobile client that I have on my phone, does nothing but do API calls. That's quite cool. And, and this is basically what the platform looks like. It's a lot of microservices. So for example, a microservice that takes care of a file. If I upload a file, that microservice makes sure it gets stored in the right way, the right people have access to it, it's encrypted, etc. So that's cool. So for these microservices, you see that more and more APIs are opened up. So more and more of these API microservice APIs we open up to the public. So you can send messages, you can create rooms, you can cre create people, you can provision. And one of the cool things is we start doing that with video. So with these microservices being available to developers, the cool thing is I can create a solution by picking a few. I created uh, one web-based application and I wanted to build in authentication because I wanted to know who was doing what. You know what I did? I just used the authentication part of, of Spark using OAuth to make sure that I knew who people were. That's quite cool. I could embed video. I can take the video APIs and embed video into my application, my iOS application, my Android application, into a web-based application. And that is, that is absolutely fantastic, because now you don't have to worry about any of the video bits. Can you imagine having, like, uh, say I would have a, uh, uh, a service where I connect people with homes to people who want to stay somewhere. Let's call it um, AirSpark or Spark BNB. Now, you, I could easily embed video into that iOS application so the renter can have a video communication with the rentee, so the owner of the home can say, well, could you please plug in the, plug in the microwave and then it will work. That's quite interesting. And do that in an easy way. So in the slides that you will get, I added these two slides with uh, where you can more find more information on this particular topic. Who has been in the, uh, the greenhouse just around the corner where we have the walk-in labs? Few people, few people. What you will see there is a, uh, a device, a video unit and a whiteboard, and we call it the Spark board. So I want you to think about this. The second I walk into the room with my free Spark client on my phone, the Spark board says, hello, DJ. And now I can share information, I can control it as a video unit. How does it understand that I'm nearby? Is it earth beams? Is it just patience? Or possibly karma? Or is it sound? So it's not using Bluetooth, it's not using Wi-Fi, it's not using GPS or, or, or anything else. What do you think? It's sound. So if you want to know more about that, so how on earth is it using sound to recognize me and now I can have, I can control it, I can use it, I can communicate. Go to the 
greenhouse and uh, you can try it yourself. You can also do some drawing on the board, that's fun, then yeah, just take the pencil. It's a next generation device you'll see coming in the enterprises, and it's a good opportunity to, to test it. Yeah, Abs that's, absolutely. That's it. nice. So I mentioned that I, uh, one of the bots that I created connects to my home. My home is very, very automated, and uh, I think that's quite cool. My friends are like, yeah, and my wife says, why can't we have normal light switches instead of voice control, gesture control, using weird remotes? But I used it to connect to my home, and I can, uh, the, with the bot, I can uh, type cam front door, and it will connect to my home. It will grab a security camera picture and post it in this Spark space. The weird thing is, I connected it to my toilet, because apparently uh, I uh, added a flush counter to my toilet, so every time somebody flushes the toilet, the computer knows about it, and a counter goes up. <laughs> and yeah, that was hard explaining it to my wife, <laughs> what the value of that was. <laughs> because I could, right? I mean, that's what it's about. In fact, it has a value. You didn't flush oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. toilet this morning. Maybe you this need to morning, go to the I, bathroom I, I, at I the moment. It, I checked you? it, and both toilets had a count of zero, which is, which is, which is not good, because <laughs> it's not supposed to. <laughs> Later, I will try, because maybe I have to check something at home. But, but the fact that I was able to build a bot that does connect to, my, to a script that runs on some hosting provider, which will then pull uh, call APIs that are uh, in my home to get information, to get my, uh, my son's weight chart, or to get the today's electricity usage. That is quite cool. And as I've mentioned before in the previous session, if I can do stuff like this, I mean, can you imagine what you guys can do? Because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that know a lot more about this topic. Then it was an introduction to what you can do with the bots to take them to the next stage. And uh, we strongly advise that a lot of people do chat at the moment. And, and it's a good way to interact because people can read their message whenever they want. But just think that the next experience is voice, video, dropping documents, and all that in the secure way with the same single sign-on. You don't resign, and it gets synchronized on all your devices. Then, uh, yeah. But if we think of it, there's other challenges we, we, we faced with DG when we implemented our bots is sometimes you're meeting a bot and you just, but who created that bot? What is it going to do is the data I'm using? And how can I contact support to say there's no fallback command? And what about my data privacy? I always have those questions when I meet a bot. And I'm sorry, guys, but there's no universal answer to that. Then what I do, I create, because I'm a good gentleman, I'm French, I'm polite, and I also always say, bonjour, au revoir, s'il vous plaît. I've added an, an about comment to my bot so that they can tell me, hey, this is the author, it's DevNet, this is where you can find the code. Then I also, sometimes if you could, if some users want to be reinsured, you just, hey, look at the code, it's there. And I had some extra information, what it does, where you can find it, and yeah, it's a lot of info. Then, if someone has added it, we need a standard to do that. But we did even more. If you think of it, a lot of times you're just talking to a bot and it doesn't answer. That's what I said I showed just before. I was interacting with the bot and it wasn't coded yet when we created our code motion Amsterdam, and there was no comment behind, but is it down? Is it slow? Why isn't it responding? I'm not going to create a command to ask my bot if he's alive, because it just doesn't work if he's dead. And then I see a lot of conversations. I play with bots all day long, and, and they say, hey, where the bot? Who has created the bot? We have to find the creator of the bot. And if we find him, we have to chat him that the bot has an issue. How can we solve that? Then, first thing I propose is we create an elf check. Let me show you. When I have a bot here, here I have a not bot sample. Then if I type that, oh, and if I change it to the token I had just before, I will be starting a Nello World bot with, uh, have I put 
the token somewhere? Have I been smart enough to do that? No, Steve, you're not smart enough. Okay, I will have to go and fetch a new token for my bot. You think it was still there? Oh, you're right. It's here. Tuck. Let's pick it there. <laughs> then now, I'm running the bot locally, and it says, hey, yeah. See this simple line of code? Your bot is running, and it's, it, its account has been detected. It's called Motion Amsterdam. Then now I can talk to him. But the bot, what I do is I expose him on the local URL. I expose my localhost. If I get there, I say, hey, this is extra information. This is my bot since when it's running. Um, the account type, it's a machine. And what does it understand? He understands message created and membership created when he's added to a room. What I also do is, hey, there are comments, you understand? He has a help command, he has a fallback, and he understands hello. Then I can say hello to that bot. Then for sure, if I go back to Cisco Spark and I run it, I will be able. But think of it now. I have the same bot running, is answering from the internet, and, oh, I should show it. On the same endpoint I created, yeah. It's not, it's also exposed on the internet. If I take back this um, URL. OK, if I expose it on the internet, I will show it. I won't show that part. I don't have enough time. But then, now you've got your bot running on the internet. We are pushing messages. It's got an health check endpoint. Now what can we build? We can create a database where we have all the bots, and we say not only the description of the bot, because that exists. There are some bot listing that has been created, some bot directory. I'm more thinking about the metadata. What about that, dot, that bot? Who created it and all that? And I think we should put it in a JSON format that would be standardized so that, and I'm looking all bot developers, <laughs> so that we would just know where is the health check endpoint. We would know the structure. We will know the messengers platform the bot can connect to, and we will be able for, to create a meta bot that would be able to answer everybody who is the creator of the bot. Here's the bot down, and all that. We could ask it to someone. You get the idea? I reserved a long time ago. I had this idea, uh, chatbot.land. We can take another domain, OK, but whoever is interested in moving that forward, uh, I haven't seen any activity in this area yet, and I think that it can be a, a great opportunity to grow um, someone's uh, skills and play around. I'm losing connectivity. Yeah, it's back. Um, next um, subjects, I have two more. Uh, hosting. Hosting a bot is a challenge. Why? It's easy, it's an API, you just deploy APIs every day. Then it's the same stuff that you have with API applied to bot. You have to do rate limitation, quotas, check that you have to secure your bot, but this is standard, and you have to scale it. But if you think of it, when you do it, it costs money. That's what you do for your website, and you pay someone to do all that, or you pay a team. What about your bot? Who's willing to pay for your bot? I think that today bot is like something people are playing with. Remember when we started creating our first mobile applications? Nobody wanted to pay, and it took years before someone says, yeah, I can put hundreds of thousands of dollars for this mobile app because it has a lot of value to connect to my users. And uh, today we are in the early stage. Nobody is really wanting to play, then we really have the bot versus pay, the pricing, the billing, then what I do generally, if it's just a prototype, and this is what I showed today, sometimes it was, there was a bit of latency, it's because I deploy my bot to Heroku 3 Dinos. OK, this, this, this thing here, it's just free, but it takes 30 seconds to wake up, and then it's up for 30 minutes, and it's, it's free. Your, for your entire life. The room ID bot, Cisco DevNet bot, all that is hosted free 
on AeroQ. Other thing you can do is you start with the big players, the big cloud players with their flip free plan. I did that, but then it doesn't last long. And then lastly, I have spent a lot of time with serverless functions, technology from Amazon, Amazon Lambda, and Google Functions. Okay, I was part of the Google Function program for a year, and it's awesome. Because what is a Google Function program? It's just you take one piece of your code, the entry point of your bot, and it typically fits the bot scenario. Because a function is an entry point, and behind that, it's code. Then remember this payload we took? We pushed to request bin. Then here, we push that payload, all those payloads, to a single Google function. And depending on what arrives, it takes decisions. That's what a bot framework does. Then now we just need to say, I want to expose these bots through a Google function or through an Amazon Lambda. And the good part is that the plans here are really cheap. Two million invocations for free on Google functions. And then the next million of time my bot gets invoked, it will cost me 40 cents for one million calls. Okay. If I get one million calls, I'm ready to pay for my, those 40 cents <laughs> for the third, more than two million calls, in fact, on Google Functions. And the calculation is a bit more tricky because you also have to take into account how much time does your bot last because it has some elapsed time. Okay? The longer it lasts, the more credits it earns on your Google Functions. Then I picked my bot framework I had created. I, I, just, I just wanted to share with you that it took me 10 minutes. I added this part. It's the entry, entry point of Google Function. And then I say, if it's a post, then I post to the handler I already have created in Express. This is the bot framework I created in Node.js, just starts with an Express endpoint. And BotKit does the same, Flint does the same, and all the Node.js framework I have behaves the same. And then I have added. Oh, I have added my extra health check. Then I check if I have an authorization, and then I go to the health check to, get, to do a get. That's so just because now I'm paying for my bot, and I don't want someone to come and to, to eat my health check forever. Uh, then I added an, an, an authorization here. And then I export it. I export this function, and I'm done. Next line of code is a command to say to Google Functions, yeah, this is the alpha program, but it still works the same. You say, Google, I, Google Cloud, I want to deploy this entry point. It will go to a bucket, an archive, a zip file. You think of it like that. When HTTP is triggered, I want you to run that function. It will be named SparkBot. And then I give it parameters. And the first one is memory because you want your bot to be small. The more memory you eat, the more expensive, and the less credits you'll get, and you will eat your 2 million credits. And then I add a timeout, always. And I think the default um, smallest interval for one credit is 100 milliseconds. It's enough for my bots to execute most of the time, even going to a Google database, uh, Google, uh, the G Cloud data store. Um, but I always put a timeout here because in case I ask an external API and it takes a minute to respond, a minute will make a lot of credits being eaten for nothing because the user won't even be here to, to, and to get the answer. Then always, if you use serverless, my advice is you, you always add a timeout there. And then we're there. Then how do you take your bots to the next stage? You, piece, you pick good programming principle, you pick the right framework. I like also frameworks that when they talk back to the messenger platform, I like frameworks that do retries automatically for me, so that if, the, if something is not working on the network aspects or for any reasons, it just retries automatically. Um, will you choose a conversations is, is not an option, I think. You should definitely use BotKit for that. Um, the hosting. The best hosting approach, yeah, it's a question of business. And then the chat ops, uh, I like to push messages to my platform saying, hey, my bot is being used by those people so that I know what's going on in real time and add some metrics like I did for Google Analytics. Two other considerations uh, when I work on bots is, should I add NLP? NLP is this natural language processing stuff saying, hey, 
your bot says, hey, what are you looking for? And say, hey, I want to eat. Oh, what do you want to eat? Um, pizza. OK, which kind of pizza? And all that. OK, it's, it's a lot of conversation, and you want to guess what the user needs. I think this kind of scenario is very B2C consumer oriented. It doesn't fit a lot of bots. Then if it's the case, then use an NLP technology. If it's not the case, just don't add the, this extra. My advice would be not to add these extra pieces, because it would require to, you to take your phrases, what the user types, go to an external service, come back. It adds latency first. And second, it adds some, a point of failure, because uh, networks never is never as reliable as more points you add, the more fragility you introduce. And the last part is you're paying for extra services you don't really use for an enterprise bot. When I call Cisco DevNet bot, I know I want to know about the next event. I don't need the bot to say, hey, what are you looking for? Oh, events. Oh, I recognize it's an event you're looking for. Then uh, if you still need NLP for your B2C context, uh, there are some NLP libraries starting. And we'll have a session at, at our next DevNet Create conference. It will be next week in San Francisco. Everybody won't be there. OK, it's short notice. <laughs> but we'll do the videos. And Nick Maris, the cl creator of the Flint framework, he will be giving his approach to do NLP with inside his Node.js code and how he does all this awesome stuff of interacting with consumers without going to external third-party services. The last one is machine learning. We are heavy on machine learning. At Cisco, we, buy, we, we bought MindMelt last week. Uh, it's a company that does AI uh, to guess your intents and all that stuff. And I think there's a wide area for bots here. I don't know if there are any people in the assistants that know about machine learning. How many? Please raise your hand. OK, guys, it's awesome. I guess you'll get, I hope you'll get richer than me and to anybody on the planet, and you'll have a happy life because there's a, it's, you're going to have, I think, tremendous years coming forward. Uh, in the bot industry, I think bots, uh, there's a good opportunity to, to make them learn incrementally. Uh, because if you think of it, every, you, you interact all day long with bots, and they can learn every time you interact. Then when you classify documents, when I have a new Twitter follower, I go and see his profile, and then I, I would like to categorize him. So, and then I would like my bot to go and automatically classify my documents, my followers, and everything I do manually. It would be artificial intelligence. And it has to be put somewhere. But someone has to pay for it. Then I think it will take some time to come up. But the technology is there. And it's a great opportunity to move forward. Then now, if you're interested, we've got some ends lab, uh, ends on. It's 15 minutes. You'll be able to do all the steps I showed today. You do it on the machine that's been prepared for you. You will create your own bot, and we'll be there to assist. And we're happy to be playing with bots and join the family. It's fun. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. <laughs> DG, join for the questions. Do you want to join? There questions? Are questions? Just raise your hand so I can bring you the microphone. I knew some of you created bots. I had some question for you. What are the next, what are the challenges you see? Uh, I named a few. Do you see all the challenges uh, that you're meeting on an everyday basis when you're creating your bots? Keeping it up to date. Keeping it up to date. Oh, updating it regularly? Yeah. The user experience of the bot. OK, how does I, yeah, how often? It needs time, budget. Is that, yeah. I think that's the point. Who's going to pay for those? Um, what we see at Cisco is that bots can be very useful from an enterprise perspective, because once your user have been connecting to the messenger platform, like Spark, we showed, the identity is known. Then to access the backend system, you know it's this person with this email address in your domain that has the identity that can call your backend process. And I think this is where you should. What we advise is we did it in the keynote. You just start building an enterprise bot, doing some easy stuff, connect to sales team, connect to marketing, giving some useful information to marketing teams. And then they will give you the money, because they will see that it gets more useful, because it's at end. It can answer quick. 
and you don't need to find your password to connect to an application. You need to learn the user interface. Maybe it's down. And the time you've done all that, you just have gone to your bot and say, hey, what are the results? Show me the last figures. And you're done. And I think this is the way it's going to start. Just start with baby steps. You just pick one platform. You create a simple bot. You connect it to your back end. You place it. And then you see the people and the marketing team. You give it to them and say, hey, do you like it? They say, yeah. Can you spend more time on it? Yes, I can. I would like to. <laughs> and that can be even useful for our users. And yeah, this is the beginning of something. Also questions? We've got one? Um, it's more of a, a thing that I think that's missing right now in the, in the chatbot uh, community. Um, it's, it's all really uh, passive. So the user talks and the, the bot answers. Um, I think that the, the, the future is more relying on um, the bot providing the information on the right time without you asking. Um, and I think that the part is missing is the smart, uh, the smart uh, 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 yeah, middle la la layer in between that helps the bot to be intelligent, to just not to be just a talking uh, uh, piece of code, but actually providing information when you need it before you even thought you need it, maybe. Uh, that's my uh, Q on that. Do you want to answer that one, DJ? Well, well, first of all, it's it's definitely this should work, by the way. Uh, it, it, it's definitely something that we can talk about because I think there's there's a very interesting discussion that has a lot more to it, and I think one of the things that it has to do with is uh, where do you want the intelligence to be? Do you want the bot to be intelligent or just the messenger? Uh. Yeah, and a bit of both because what we see is generally you want to tackle some data to do some treatment locally before sending it to a richer service because there's a lot of data to store. But sometimes the phrasing, everything that is user specific, you want to do it locally. We've got a lot of research going on at Cisco on those topics. It's, 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 I mentioned MindMeld, we just bought, but as a startup company, it's a big startup now, they do enterprise and wonderful knowledge and voice recognition and stuff like that. And yeah, there's, I think it's the opportunity. And yeah, if you've got those skills, just choose the right company you're working with and make sure they, they make you happy because you can have fun and you can create a lot of value there. And it's an interesting topic. And uh, yeah, I, I, are there any machine learning sessions during code motion? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Yeah, that's a great area. And uh, at Cisco, if some of you are students, um, we do a lot of internships and we, we would be really happy to have some, some, some people join. And if you're professionals, just do your job as usual. We've got a lot of partners and um, local teams also. They can also point you to technologies. Uh, personally, at Cisco DevNet, what we do is we try to gather what the community builds, and we try to push them moving forward and show what others are building. Then if you have any awesome bot and you want to make it famous, just go to DevNet, and uh, you have my you know me now. <laughs> and uh, you say, hey, Steve, I don't speak French, but I met you at Codemotion, and uh, I'm ready to, yeah, I would like you to, yeah, look at my bot, and uh, we should, pr ah, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's promote it in Europe. And uh, I work in Europe, and yeah, we can, we can do that, definitely. I'll be happy. Thank you very much, all. <laughs>